giving you a voice. Making it loud our own way. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the fun. fun. First Updates Now FRC is produced in partnership with Stryker. Discover why so many FIRST alumni and mentors are putting Stryker first when it comes to their careers. Visit careers.stryker.com forward slash first to view openings, internships, and co-ops tailored to those who are in FIRST. That's careers.stryker.com forward slash first. And by the Blue Alliance. Keep up to date on all live and archived FIRST Robotics events and team stats at thebluealliance.com. And also viewers like you. We need your help to keep fun loud, live, and independent. Help us by visiting our Patreon to pledge your support at patreon.com forward slash first updates now. You can also support fun live on Twitch for a few bucks a month or by linking your Prime account for free and clicking subscribe. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Infinite Recharge. It's here. We're so excited uh, for it. Uh, man, we got a lot going on here uh, for First Capital RE3D, of course. Uh, internet connection is a little shady today, so bear with us as we go through this. A lot of cool stuff uh, coming on uh, through here as well. And we can't wait to talk about uh, Infinite Recharge and what's going on with it and how you guys like it in chat. This is going to be a very big chat interaction show. So chat, we want to hear what you think about this. Don't forget to take at first updates now in chat. Um, and I got Heather uh, off to our side here who's going to be taking your questions. Uh, we'll take those uh, all during the show. As I mentioned, the internet, little spotty today. Uh, we got Comcast. Please go, you know, tag them and be like, go fix Fun's internet. Uh, but they're coming tonight. <laughs> and uh, so it's going to be a little spotty today. So bear with us as we go through this. We're recording all this locally as well. So you can always catch it after the show. But um, I do want to introduce our guests that we have uh, here today. We got a few great ones. Uh, well, all of them are great, I should say, right? I, I don't want to. <laughs> Only a few. <laughs> so that'll happen. But. Sitting over to, well, screen left, but my right is uh, Caleb, uh, who is now teamless, right, Caleb? So currently teamless. Yeah. Cur currently teamless, but uh, an alumni of 2052, right? 2052, and I found college. out, apparently, I gave you a Dean's List. Uh, I announced your Dean's List award in 2012, so Back small in 2012, world. 2012, yeah. Yeah, so if you guys don't know uh, about Caleb, uh, he is all over uh, the Chief Delphi scene. Uh, the uh, ELO, ELO, how do you pronounce it again? I, I say ELO. ELO, yeah. okay. Uh, ELO is something that we use in the FRC <laughs> Top 25, which Caleb didn't invent, but he modified it for uh, what what is used in first uh, pretty widely. So uh, so really cool with that. Uh, we're delighted to have you on board, uh, and we'll catch you with you in just a little bit. We also have Kirstine, is, uh, of course, uh, one of our hosts from Roast and Robots, uh, and uh, one of our fun admin members as well, too, and uh, also a mentor on 125. Uh, thanks for coming on, Christine. <laughs> Thanks for having me and not as a host. So I'm excited I mean, to go always, over some stuff. You're always on the clock, right? So uh, and yeah. we also have we also have Dave as well too, who's also a, uh, now a, a crew member on Fun. Uh, so delighted to bring uh, Dave on board. Uh, and he's from team number 6328. Uh, what does that say? Anti Robot Robot Club. All right, let me, let me see it one. <laughs> These are our, uh, we're going to be repping these on our Thursday practice day shirts. So. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, so Dave's, apparently you're the hero, Dave. The chat loves you already. So uh, so we do have a giveaway we're going to be doing dur uh, doing during this stream. It has been a long day. I'm just going to say that straight up. Uh, and, <laughs> but uh, from our friends, uh, we have, actually, I'll hold it up here in a second, but I'm also going to put it on screen. Uh, we have from Refire Solutions. Give me away during the show, and thanks to Refire Solutions for providing that giveaway uh, through here. Oh, audio might have been gone. Yeah. Okay. All right. So once again, we're giving away the Refire Refire Quick Connect as we go through. Like I said, guys, expect issues during the show. It's just going to happen. It's the way these are sometimes as we go through, but it will be a good time as we go through. So once again, Refire Solutions. Let's see if we can do it one more time on here. I think it's going to work now. Yes, there we go. So once again, Refire Solutions with a Quick Connect Anderson Power Pole. Uh, Anderson Power Pole connector fitting most of your 515 7 to series style motors. Uh, so once again, if you want to win this uh, later on, there's a keyword you need to type in. Make sure you click that little follow button near the top of the screen, and that is your opportunity to get in. Uh, if you are a subscriber, help support fun, stay loud, live, and independent, you're going to get five times luck uh, to win. So 
Uh, let's jump right in. Uh, I know we got some questions uh, that we want to go through, but I kind of want to do an around the horn here. And Caleb, I'm going to start with you. Uh, infinite recharge. First of all, how long have you been in first for? Uh, 2010 was my first season. Break away. Okay, 2010. And uh, infinite recharge. How's it stacking up so far? What are your opinions on how that looks? I, I think it looks like a pretty fun game. It's it's a mesh of uh, 2016, obviously, with the balls. And uh, the, the way it looks like cycles are going to run reminds me a lot of 2013, which was a really fun year. I, it was a really fun year to be a part of and to play. So... Um, you know, I'm hoping it's going to have the, the best aspects of both of those years and, uh, you know, not all the bad things, but you know, we'll see how it goes, but I, I I'm pretty excited. It should be fun. Yeah. And you know, I, I'm kind of excited to have the, uh, the size of the ball back. It's very reminiscent of 2006 to me. Uh, yes, I'm old. Yeah, that'll happen. Um, so I'm excited to have that back. Of course, we'll be doing a lot of testing here at First Capital in regards to how those work out in regards to shooter. Uh, and you can check out some of the videos on YouTube as well. So, uh, Dave, let's bring you on here. How long have you been in first, and how's Infinite Recharge stacking up for you? Um, I love this game. I've been around, I think my first year was 1999. I was five years old. My dad started Gus. So I've kind of uh, grew up with it. I would have to say, out of all the games that I've experienced, this has got to be absolutely one of my favorite games. Um, it's kind of a lot of different cycling uh, game. Like Caleb said, it reminds me a lot of 2015. I've had one of my favorite years. Um, the 2012 aspect of the shooting the balls up high, I love that, and that was a great year. So uh, I think it'll be pretty good. Yeah, and sorry, our internet's a little shady here, so you did cut out a little bit on that, but we know you're excited uh, in regards to, the, to this game. Uh, just to kind of recap, if you had to say one thing that really sticks out to you, what would that be? Um, I think the uh, hmm. I think the big thing has got to be, for me, the hanging and the uh, finding a way to maybe hang with some other people or controlling that. I think that big, that that's like a huge, huge scoring gap in comparison to shooting the uh the game pieces up high is you could get realistically you get three robots hanging up there and you get a balance that's probably more points than a lot of teams will put up um as far as using game pieces i think in uh multiple matches so that's pretty standout and christine how about you uh you know uh looking at this game there's a lot of uh, only one game piece right which is kind of interesting uh compared to a couple mm -hmm. different years so how's this stacking up for you yeah, so I'm in a very similar boat to Dave. Um, my first year was 1998. I was in third grade, so I've seen seen a lot of games. I've experienced a lot of games, and I'm excited for this one because it's it's really different in the sense that you know the the field is completely different than anything we had seen before. Um, it looks like they definitely took into consideration how much the rockets blocked everybody's view in the venue and outside the venue last year. So I'm, ex I'm hoping that the webcasts are a lot better this year. Um, but I think I'm excited, too, about the balls. Um, I was asking one of our mentors who has been around about as long as I have, um, you know, how to, like, size-wise, are they similar to, you know, like 2012 or uh, Stronghold or 2006? And I think 2006 was a 6-inch ball, so this one's 7. So it's really, really similar to 06, um, which I think is really cool. It's like not too big, not teeny tiny. And I'm excited to see the shooting. I was really happy to see that, you know, to get from different stages or in autonomous or whatever, that the quantity of balls doesn't matter where they're scored. So I think a lot of like younger teams or just less capable teams that aren't able to do the high shooting will be able to really contribute with the low goal there. Um, my favorite thing I would say so far is the color wheel. And we have a spinning <laughs> wheel at my house that we got from Ikea. So I'm excited that there's a wheel on the field this year. Yeah. Um, so let's kind of start from the from the top here. Uh, looking at one, Autonomous is back, uh, which I, I don't know how you guys felt about that. I thought they'd keep the Sandstorm. I, I thought overall it was pretty well received uh, compared to uh, Autonomous modes in previous years. So I'm a little surprised to see... Autonomous come back, Sandstorm's gone. Uh, Caleb, how do you feel about uh, Autonomous Mode being back? I, I'm happy Autonomous Mode is back. I uh, I think, you know, I, like a lot of things, I, I think it's fun to try something different at least once just to see how it, how it goes. So I don't mind at all that, you know, first gave Sandstorm a shot last year. But I think the 
for me what's big is when I you know talk about the the game to people outside of first or try to build up hype for a game I think autonomous period is one of the really big selling points from there is that you can just say hey these are robots running by themselves without any human control um, so from that perspective I'm very glad to have uh, autonomous back you know that, that's a fair fair point with that uh, in regards to bringing it up to other people right and what gets them interested for things and uh, I agree uh, you know with that is that you know people looking at it like oh it's just people behind driving it's like no these have to be pre-programmed and that's can be a big selling point so uh dave how are you feeling about in regards to not just autonomous being back but maybe the autonomous mode and what objectives maybe you can accomplish for it uh this year as well yeah so we were breaking down this a little bit today i'm happy to see the autonomous mode back i think having sandstorm last year um really helped everybody get moving in the first 15 seconds but i think having that challenge of really doing the pre-programmed 15 seconds is good for a lot of the teams um i see just right out of the gate if you can score you're holding those three three uh what are these things called I, are they just sure called balls right. by power the way or cells. Power, oh, cells. power cells okay power cells yeah power, power cells. cells power cells. i was scrambling looking through the manual and making sure i said it right so <laughs> the, you got the three power cells that you're holding so scoring those off quick and then you got a bunch of them that are kind of behind you in the in your two zones right there so maybe you'll see a lot of teams kind of making a mad dash to grab those and maybe uh, getting some other ones off beforehand or at least getting lined up and then uh, making their way across the field to start a cycle. I think that'll that'll be big. Yeah, and, and Christine, uh, I'll just kind of follow up with you in here. Autonomous mode, uh, uh, how are you feeling about it being back? And is it, you know, looking at 125, which is a team that obviously has performed quite well over the last few years, what are you guys most looking forward to? So I'm glad that it's just autonomous because from a, you know, person that runs events perspective, it just seemed like Sandstorm, there was so much lag and there were just so many issues with teams getting like the experience that I think they were hoping for um, in terms of like if they were actually operating. So I'm, I'm glad it's just back to autonomous. I also think it'll be uh, better when somebody wins the autonomous award that there is autonomous this year. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so I'm, I'm happy for that. Um, with 125 this year, I think it's going to be an exciting year for us because we've we've gotten pretty good in terms of um, integrating programming into our uh, mechanisms because we have a lot more experienced programming mentors on the team now. Um, so I think that'll be really cool, especially with the shooting aspect because 2017 we were able to really dial things in. I am really curious to see how many teams get really accurate in the high goal like high like center goal um like getting it in there since there isn't any vision tape or anything around that space and i'm also concerned because from somebody that runs events we shove the field into pods that get shipped from event to event mm. so how accurate or consistent is that placing going to be at every event you know that teams go to or you know is it gonna is there gonna be a huge variant between you know week one events somewhere and then you know week five even in the same i don't know i'm hoping that that doesn't happen but we'll see but i think um neutrons i think are going to be pretty pumped to do some shooting and yeah that should be good another another quick thought on auto is i i think sandstorm was a good fit for last last season last game um just because there was so much precision required to place game pieces um whereas this one you know, it's you can have a team just pre-line up their robot before the match and, uh, you know, take blind shots and maybe you hit them, maybe you don't. But um, it was much harder to do something like that last year because of how far you had to travel and how precise the uh, the scoring was. So, yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I'm, I'm glad that with the shooting, there's the ability like if you miss you don't completely miss you still get something sure um it's kind of like ski ball but <laughs> because, like, the boiler the last time we had like shooting shooting it was like you had to be completely dialed in and it was inc incredibly difficult to get into that kind of placement that the balls needed to be in but i think with the kind of double opening it's like okay if you get lucky cool but if you work really hard and you know figure out a way to to line that up every time then awesome so, uh, 
when I when I look at it, as we kind of just keep transitioning forward, then um, I want to talk about some of the game elements in, in regards to this. Obviously, we only have one game piece this year uh, in regards to the power power cell. Is that right? Power cell. Yeah. Is that what they were called in two thousand nine? Or what? No, those are power cubes. Pa- no, no. Two thousand nine. Two thousand nine. Uh, Lun- I wasn't around then. That was that yeah, was before Lun- me. <laughs> that was lunacy. Oh, because there were super cells and empty cells and moon rocks. Okay, so yeah, there were close. Okay, uh, so looking at <laughs> looking at, at power cells, uh, but then also the other dynamics of you know the climbing aspect, which I think we'll talk a bit more. The color wheel. I mean, really, the color wheel could be considered a game piece, kind of right. It's not movable, uh, but yeah, it's but the greatest you, game piece. Of all. <laughs> so okay, so I'm interested to talk about that, Christine. I, you mentioned it a little bit, but what, I mean, what do you like that so much for? Because I, you know, to me, like the visual, it could be a cool and I visual can't element. What they were called? Yeah, it's not it's called, called the, the. It should be called the color wheel. Control panel. Control panel. Control panel. Control panel. Yeah. yeah. Control panel. But somebody referred to it as the color wheel, like to me at the very start of it. And I was like, "What? That's the name of the piece." Um, but it's different. I think it's exciting for me because it's. It's a completely different way that you have to interact with a field element. We haven't seen something that you just like have to go and like, I don't know, like be quick with at times, but then very accurate at the same time. And it's interesting to me because I don't know what it would look like from the driver station or, you know, how the operators are going to be able to, you know, see what they're doing when they're interacting with that. So that to me was really cool that. It's just a, a different type of field element that requires accuracy but speed sometimes. So, and it's color wheel. I'm an art teacher, so yeah, color wheel always gets me jazzed up. Kayla, can you break down a little bit more on like how the color wheel works, just points wise, and how that is going to kind of break down? Sure. Yeah. So it's um, there's two different ways to use the color wheel. The first is rotation control, um, which is you need to spin it three three full rotations around at least but not more than five rotations around um and you can only do that after you've scored uh 20 the stage two um the stage two scoring for the uh i forget what i want to say the rocket power but cells. it's the, yeah the power cells up in yeah. the, up in there um so you, you have to get it around three to five times, and then after that, then there's position control, uh, which is you need to set it to a certain color, and you don't know what that color is until after it's been spun around three to five times, and then the FMS will send a signal, send a message out to your driver station, and maybe there's going to be some visual indicator on the on the audience display. I, I'm not totally sure, but um, you find find out halfway through the match what color it is you have to set it to and then you have to turn it to that color you know i think still within that three to five rotations so so dave let me ask you you know we've looked at previous years especially for maybe lower resource teams that there's been kind of these unitasker robots right where they maybe do just one thing pretty well is it possible or even viable for a team that's a low resource team to maybe just do the color wheel or should they be focusing on something else yeah, no, I need absolutely. to quit calling it color wheel. By the way, always I'm gonna that's gonna be embedded in my head. But control panel. Control yeah. panel. <laughs> control panel. Yeah. No, I definitely think there's a huge opportunity for uh, some of these low source, low resource teams that are kind of going to be um, targeting one simple, or what maybe not one simple one task. Um, I think there's a lot of room for improvement for how quickly you can get those tasks done, and then maybe be like a low a low goal cycler. Um, There was a lot of talk with uh, some of my friends put in together just what you would uh, what you would see for a team that would kind of be like a low resource team. Right. And just a a low goal cycler and somebody who is able to very accurately and quickly uh, maintain that wheel. I think that that's something that teams that don't have a ton of resources but have the ability to do something just if they had to pick one thing and do it really well, that would be the thing, right? Because you could go do that at the beginning of a, so like a week one or a week two, right? So you're going to have some teams that 
are going to go out there and be really good at scoring in the high goal and hanging, but they're going to be looking for that that uh, that partner that has the ability to kind of connect them with those those points that are aligned with the uh, the color wheel, so to speak. So I think I think there is a lot of opportunity for people, and I'm incredibly excited to see some of these teams for how quickly that they're going to be able to get it done. Sure. Um, I think it's it's going to be something that you're going to see. I think by the time we get to like um, the district championships, you're going to see teams like driving up to it and spinning that wheel, and it's going to be happening so fast. They're going to be lining it up with whatever color it is. It's going to be so fast. It's like you're going to blink, and it's going to happen. So I think that'll be a really cool aspect of the game. But I definitely think that that's something that a low resource team could focus on and do really, really well and be super beneficial for uh, for a good pick. Um, something I just want to plug in, by the way, too, we have up on screen. If you haven't uh, seen yet from First Capital RE 3D, uh, there is some testing with the uh, red color sensor and how it interacts both on the uh, top and bottom of the color wheel. Uh, so make sure you go check that out as well, too. There's some great stuff. Uh, a lot of it was almost plug and play from what I'm told. So uh, it is very available for many teams to do this objective, and I think it would be a, a great way to contribute to your alliance for something like that as well. Uh, so uh, I want to move on uh, a couple of questions. We're going to talk about climbing just a little bit, uh, but let's talk about the power cells itself. Uh, I know there's a question in chat in regards to uh, if turrets uh, might be something. So I'd love to talk about what you guys feel about in regards to the strategy behind power cells. Uh, are we always going to be shooting? You know, we did some testing earlier uh, just trying to throw the power cell into that, that small hole which I'm sure has a name that I'm missing too. Uh, and it was not easy. It was quite difficult uh, to do. And obviously we're humans, not robots. Uh, but I do want to ask uh, on there, there was a question from uh, uh, Murdani808 uh, asks about the importance of having a turret in regards to cells and shooting. So are turrets going to be viable this game? And what else could we be looking at for a good strategy for using the power cells? Um. Well, I would say if you look at the field, look at where teams are going to be shooting from. I think the uh, the obvious shot place to shoot from is right in front of the um, all of the scoring locations because that's a safe zone for you. Um, the other potential scoring spot that we might see a lot of would be over at the end of the trench run because that's also a, a safe zone for a robot. Outside of that, you don't really have too many other spots that you can uh, comfortably uh shoot from and feel feel secure in shooting at so um it, it'll just kind of depend on how teams if if you want that added security because if you're if you're shooting out in the open fields you, you got to do it really fast before a defender comes over and hits you and yeah, we'll just kind of do yeah. the the round table christine go ahead yeah i would agree with what caleb just said the things that come to mind are like 2013 was all about speed and cycling and teams were really just like latched onto those protected zones or somewhere where they could literally just budge themselves up against something hard and shoot you know and i don't remember many teams having turrets unless they were full court shooters um or even in like you know 2017 it's a little different but the teams that were kind of like shooting not you know buckets full of fuel uh were just kind of like hopping and go which i think is what we're gonna see here especially because there's so many options to do it in a protected zone like and it'll just make things a lot easier so i don't think it, a turret's needed i think it'll just overcomplicate things just driver practice <laughs> david how about you yeah so my initial thoughts on this was looking i'm i'm really curious to see some of the shooting angles so when i first think of a turret right you kind of want to you're utilizing that resource that you're building into your robot to kind of um open up your range from where you can shoot from right um what kind of angles teams can get at and what the real uh like the real area that teams can more accurately shoot uh, the power cells from and get it into the power port because i think that range is might be a little bit smaller than people realize because that's not a, a very big uh, opening up there, and you do have a seven-inch ball, so it's going to be pretty large. So I don't. I think that the area the teams are going to be um, the teams are going to be parking to make all of the shots is going to be a lot smaller. So a turret might not really be beneficial, right? Because uh, it would be really beneficial if you could be all the way on the other side of the field and quickly turn and navigate. But if this is something where you're only going to have three or four different places on the field that you can accurately make a shot, 
then it might just be easier for you to drive up, uh, press up against a wall, or get cornered up in your trench. I know that those were our initial thoughts on it. Um, something I want to ask about is, uh, well, first of all, can we talk a little bit more about the safe zones? Because that is something that we've seen in previous years of uh, FRC, but it really didn't exist for the most part last year, except during the uh, the HAB climb, right? So can we discuss a little bit more about what the safe zones are? And then what I want to ask you on top of that, and, and Dave, why don't we start with you for that, is uh, will teams be shooting from other places? And how far could we see full court shooters? Would that exist? Uh, yeah, so you have your trench zone, which is if you are fully in it, then a team can't come in and, uh, and make contact with you. I believe that that's a tech foul for them. And then you have this triangle target zone that's right underneath your, your power port um, that if you're touching that and a team touches you, it's a penalty. So I, I believe we're going to see the majority of the shooting from those areas. Um, something that I talked about a little bit with some friends was um, – you, so like you can't do full court shooting, right? You can't do it yeah. if you're in your your sector, right? So you have to be past that line at least. So I I do anticipate seeing at least a small margin, small number of teams that are in that um, the first initial trend zone area underneath before your pinwheel on your loading zone side of the field. I would be, I think it would be crazy to see a team that would just go straight from the loading zone and kind of park as soon as they make it into that trench zone and are shooting over the color wheel and making it all the way across the shot. I think those will be probably the farthest shots that we'll see, um, but it'll be a lot more likely that they'll be coming from the loading zone and either running up under the, um, under the trench and through the trench run all the way to the end of that, getting as close as they can with still being protected or coming around through their ravenous point and um, and either connecting with the trench again to get a safe area or up to their loading or their target zone. Yeah, I think I think we're going to see some of that for sure. And and I think the key thing to remember with that is if you take a shot, take a bunch of shots from that area right behind the um, the control panel, it's even if you miss them or miss most of them or all of them, that's not worthless. It's not like you just didn't do anything there you now have a whole bunch of balls over on the other side of the field and you can have your partners over there pick them up and and shoot closer shots over there so i think you know if you if you you might just see some robots go and take take a bunch of shots there and if they make them awesome great and if they don't you know whatever just go back and grab some more and just keep keep cycling up like that um, something I, I want to bring up in chat, and we will chat, take a few of your questions, so don't forget to tag at first updates now uh, for doing that. Uh, Ferrari 77 said, uh, from the back of the trench and touching your spinner, which is about 35 feet away, you do have a clear line of sight to the inner goal. Uh, so if we can find a way to make that shot, it should be very valuable. And, yeah, I mean, that's uh, – I think we need to talk about sight lines in a little bit too because it is a very blocked field in many cases, right? Um, but I do want to get uh, before that to the uh, kind of the other – uh, uh, find a way to score for things in regards to the climb uh, and what that looks like. I like the interesting dynamic of the balancing this year. I think that's kind of cool. Uh, it's it's like how they may, should have done the 2012 bridge almost, right? So uh, <laughs> looking, you know, looking, and, and there's no co-op point with it. So, um, and, and another yeah. thing we'll be speaking about Thank is ranking goodness. point. So, so yeah, so uh, Kale, to start with you and then Christine, um, looking at the, the balance of the climb on it, uh, how do you feel about that? Uh, were you looking at it? I know it was asked in uh, chat uh, in regards to uh, from Necro Creature about thoughts on double climbing, like carrying a partner. Are we going to see something like like a la power power up again, where you pick up another partner as well? I, yeah, I mean certainly the the top teams. If if that's if you really want that ranking point, that's how you need to do it to to guarantee it is to to pull up a partner. Um, with you as you as you go up and then and then balance on your own. So I think at the at the very highest level, yeah, we're we're absolutely going to see um, you know teams lifting up other teams. But I don't think it's I don't think it's going to be a I think it's going to be on the same scale of um, of prevalence as you know pulling up a partner was you know two years ago or um, so so yeah about about like that. How about you, Christine? What are your thoughts in regards to uh, climb? First off, what's 125 for Adrius? Tell us all of it. And then, uh, you know, what what are your thoughts? Are we going to see the buddy climbs with it as well? Um, I have no idea what we're going to do. 
for hanging. Um, but I think last year was a great segue into this year in terms of all the different approaches that teams took to to make sure that they were up or their partners were up. Um, I can't wait to see what Citrus does after what they did last year. <laughs> but I'm if I've read the rules correctly or actually listened to my team's discussion correctly, I'm relieved to see that the the like height that you are hanging at is not going to be a factor in it like there's not going to be some like line that we have to get past or some ref will have to decide if we're higher than that um unless i'm wrong in that but i don't think i am because i'm staring no, at you right I think okay. it's just off the ground i never trust myself for like restating yeah. a, a rule because that's definitely not my wheelhouse here but when that was brought up in our team discussion today i was like oh thank god because we always just have like the worst luck at the beginning of the season with that stuff. So I was glad to see that, and then I I really do envision at some point some sort of like buddy bar or something for teams to latch onto to get all three up. Um, I am really curious to see how sensitive the balancing is. Uh, one of our mentors who is an alumni of Infinite Loop is mentoring our team now, and she works for PTC and has been working on the AR for the field. Um, sure. And she was saying that when they went for work to go interact with the field that was like a, a big thing that the um, field design people talked about is like there's a certain degree of you know it has to be within this this area to get that balance so um, I'm really curious to see how that actually interacts with robots since sometimes we see things totally different at the official field than what they tell you to make at your um, build sites so I do see I do anticipate some like falling robots, but luckily it doesn't seem like it would be as severe of a <laughs> crash down to the floor. Um, and I'm really curious to see um, kind of how they're gonna have teams remove their robots from this thing. Yeah. Since in past years, there's always been some sort of like specific way that you have to go and you know retrieve your robots. Yeah, like the the 2016 like the ratchet latch that sort of thing like that. Yeah. That you had, yeah. Yep. So looking, uh, uh, I want to take some questions from chat here and have maybe some discussions on this and how we feel about the overall gameplay, that sort of thing. Um, one thing I don't bring up, Azatoth uh, sent us a couple pictures for sight lines uh, as well, too. So I do want to bring those up uh, on here and talk about the sight lines a little bit and, and see, you know, what, what this is like. Uh, so this is one of the pictures that he sent, which uh, is pretty much just showing from the, uh, this is called the trench, right? Um, trench and, run still haven't gotten these all down but it'll be interesting you know from trench run it looks like a pretty clear sight line from what he sent but uh how about other areas how about the drivers and stuff how are the drivers going to fare uh in this dave what are, what's your opinion on you know looking from behind the glass uh on how that's going to be yeah so i i tried to put a little bit of effort to get as close to the field as i could today when i was up in manchester this morning for kickoff uh, it was kind of hard to tell from the side uh, but obviously you have that huge structure in the middle of the field and that's obviously going to be a big uh a big issue as far as sideline um i don't think it'll be too terrible as far as i'm a little bit concerned about the driver station that's in the corner and it's on an angle um i i'm not exactly sure why why that's a thing but i think that that being on an angle and then combined with a little bit of the uh the structure in the middle i think that might pose a little bit of an issue um, but other than that, I'm, I'm hoping it won't be too bad. Maybe coming back through the trench, um, that might be a little difficult. Mm. Yeah, I'm really hoping that I don't like. I can't tell from the field model where the referees are going to be. But last year, oh, yeah. something I noticed during events, it's like it was actually at um, whatever district event Dave's team and my team were together. It was Shrewsbury, yeah. So Shrewsbury. at that district event, you know, from the stands i could see a ref calling like a, a pinning foul like they were counting pins but from where the driver's station was the ref was literally like parallel to the rocket so the drivers couldn't see it and the coaches couldn't see it but the audience could see it and i think in the manual or somewhere last year in an official document like it was saying that refs are not required to like you know lean over to make sure everybody can see like they were on their rest station but the rocket was blocking it so like i don't think there's going to be something that severe in terms of like not being able to see something super important like ref calls but i think there is going to be some element of like not 
quite being able to see clearly across the field, but not as bad as steam works or, you know, the refs behind the rock as last year. So. Caleb, something I, they, oh, sorry. I was going to say, Caleb, something I think that's interesting on here is that we'll see on screen is that that, that far driver station is tilted yeah. uh, versus the, here's the other thing. So one thing coming, I mean, a couple things, I'm really surprised they did something like that. Cause it's been, this is kind of the same for over a decade now, pretty much, right? Yeah, so, it's weird to me. Yeah, so it is a little strange they did that. Maybe it's to improve sight lines or something. I, I, I haven't heard all the – I've watched all these videos without the audio on them. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see, uh, you know, why this. But to me, you know, teams have built their practice fields for a long time, <laughs> and they're going to now the you take a giant hacksaw and put a hinge on it or something like that now, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, at least it's a little bit less space and a little bit more space because that would be probably more work. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Um, so I, a couple of things I want to bring up. Uh, we are going to move on. We're going to start that giveaway, actually, in just a minute uh, as we go through here. Uh, but before we start that giveaway, we do have to talk about uh, we have a lot of people who are helping support our first capital uh, show. We'll talk about a lot of them soon. But I do want to talk about uh, that who is directly supporting fun, and that is our friends at Striker. So uh, if you're a follower of fun, uh, of course, you've been hearing about this. Striker has stepped up in a big way to help support us because they believe in fun and they believe in you in first. So Striker is an awesome uh, leading medical technology company, and they are looking uh, to bring on tons of people that are in first because they want people. They, they know that you guys are the best workers out there, and they've had great success with them. They want to bring more people in. So uh, go check out careers.striker.com if you're interested in more careers. Uh, from Striker, uh, internships, co-ops, anything like that as well, too. Uh, careers.striker.com forward slash first. Uh, and I'll just give a little antidote here. Uh, I, I had the birth of my child just a few weeks ago. I was in the hospital, and I turned left. I turned right. And now I feel like I see Striker equipment everywhere now. Uh, it, it's like when you buy a car and you see your car everywhere now. It's the same thing. So Striker has really been uh, big to help support us, and they're very keen on keeping fun, wild, live, and independent. So that's why we're fans of them as well, too. And, of course, uh, a great company as well. So go to careers.striker.com. And thanks again to Striker for helping support fun, stay loud, live, and independent. Uh, with that said we are going to start our first giveaway for the uh refire uh quick connect uh with anderson power pole on here which will bring up on screen uh we'll ship that out to you if you're interested all you gotta do is click that little follow button near the top of your screen and you need to type in the following keyword refire easy enough right uh so type in refire that's the keyword to type in we'll be drawing for that in just a little bit uh and good luck to all teams or well kind of competing but i meant everybody's entering this as well too uh refire once again and uh we'll draw for that uh in about 10 minutes or so uh so good luck to everybody with that uh, so I do want to take some questions from chat uh, as we go in here, uh, starting with Infect Player asks, can you all discuss uh, tall robot versus short robot uh, that can do the trench? Uh, so, Christine, uh, let's start with you, if you don't mind. How are you feeling in regards to that, you know, navigating the trench? It kind of reminds me of 2016 with the low bar or, or 2001 yeah. if you want to get real old, right? Uh, and <laughs> uh, I, what are you looking at? Are, are you going to build a tall robot and not care or are you going to stay short? I mean, we always find a way to be compact and small, and uh, I think we'll continue to stay with that. Tall robots are just like pain in the butt. You got to ship them somehow. Um, yeah. Can't uh, put actually, them in a car. You don't have to ship them. Yeah. Most cars that our mentors have, <laughs> it would not fit in. So I think we'll probably go short or at least compact. Um, and it's, it's always seemed to work for our team. So, yeah. I mean, something to bring up on here, too, is the size of the trench. If we talk about that, Caleb, uh, you have the, the opening from floor is 2 feet 4 inches yep. on there. That's not a lot That's of space short. for something like that. So what might, what might a team sacrifice by going short as well, too? Obviously, the height of where they're shooting from potentially, right? Unless they do something, you know, yeah. like a 971 crazy from a few years ago, right? Well, yeah, and if you're if you're looking to climb, too, you, you need all that height to, to climb somehow uh so if you're tall you're just you're already most of the way there and you just have a little bit more to go but if you're short you have to have if if you're looking to climb even if you're not looking to shoot high you have to have something to to go all the way all the way up there so i think those are you know trade-offs that teams are going to have to make i i don't think i don't think being tall or being short is a prerequisite for success in this game i think we're going to see lots of successful robots that are strictly tall and we'll see plenty of successful robots that are strictly short and then we'll see plenty of successful ones that you know transform their way 
one way or the other so that they can do both. Um, and, and chat, we want to uh, ask from you too, what is your team looking at doing? Obviously, hopefully you haven't fully decided it's day one, right? And you should be analyzing a lot more. Uh, but let us know in chat. Are you guys uh, looking for a tall bot? Or are you looking to be short and go uh, through the trench as well too? Uh, Dave, how are you feeling about where's uh, 6328 feeling? Uh, and where are you feeling personally about it as well too? Yeah, so we talked about this a lot today uh, with our mentor group and with all of the students, kind of the, the, uh, the trade-offs back and forth. Um, just kind of thinking in terms of cycle time and what's the quickest way to get back and forth across the field. Um, I, with probably 92% accuracy, and all of the mentors and students that are watching this right now are probably going to be like, why are you, you saying this? But hashtag open alliance, we're, uh, we're trying <laughs> to give a clear and open uh throughout process line throughout the course of the season. I think we'll end up going uh, going short, being about 27 inches tall, going back and forth through the trench and have the ability to go through the, uh, the ravenous zone. Um, our big worry is just obviously getting blocked and finding the places on the field where, uh, where we can successfully get a shot off and not have to worry about somebody that's uh, 45 inches tall being in our, in our, um, our, our sight line. I think that, uh, It'll definitely make hanging a little bit more tricky, but I think the it'll the amount that it'll be more difficult to make a, a good uh, compact hanger is less than it would be uh, to not utilize the the trench. Yeah, and I think in New England especially we see so many taller or like medium sized robots, I guess that it it just makes more sense, I guess to go short so you can maneuver around and be, you know, a bit quicker, even if it means having to deal with, you know, getting blocked as long as you can be maneuverable, at least from what I've seen in our district in the past, um, it definitely pays off. It's yeah, absolutely. I think the big thing with being, uh, being short, just being really quick and then getting a ton of driver practice against defense will be, will be really critical to being, uh, being able to make those quick cycle times. So I think that'll, that'll end up being our big focus is, uh, keeping it to a certain height, getting a really accurate shooter, and then just building it and getting as, as much driver practice as we can against that, uh, that classic New England D. Yeah, it, it's, it really depends on the robots that you're partnered up with. Um, I think alliances that end up with three all tall robots are gonna be struggling a little bit because it'll be much easier to choke them out and block their paths. Um, but if you have one low robot, uh, you're fine. If you have two low robots, you're fine. But then if you have three, if all of them are low robots, I don't think you're really gaining much at that point uh, with the third one being low, and you may as well have, you know, two low and one high. So well, That's similar to 2016 as well too, right? Yeah. So, uh, and it's something I want to bring up, uh, Dave, that you brought up was defense as well too. And Caleb, you touched on it a little bit as well. Uh, how is defense going to play? And we only have a few minutes left, so I'm going to ask that we be a little bit quicker so we go through some of the uh, questions we have here. But uh, you said practice for defense. What does that mean to 6328? Um, so for us, that really just means putting our uh, competition drive team and our backup drive team and just having them kind of go against each other as much as possible with our practice drive train and our competition robot. Um, just trying to get simulate as much as we possibly can as close as we can to a competition setting um you look at all of the footage from year over year and there's always a um like when defense is allowed in the game in new england you see a ton of it so that'll be a big a uh, a big thing that we'll focus on and really just make sure that our drivers are prepared to to be able to drive around anybody but Caleb, where are we going to see that defense happen on the field? Where is that going to come into play? Um, I think we're going to see. I, if if you want to look at how I I think defense is going to go, I think the best game to look at for comparison would be like uh, twenty thirteen, uh, where you have a big open field with some obstacles in the way that some of them you can drive under if you're if you're a short robot, but not every robot can. Um, but uh, the only protected spots are right where you're shooting from and right where you're loading from. And, I mean, it's it's not a perfect example because you still have the, the trench run, but I think we're going to see a lot of robots cycling right under the shield generator because that's, that's a really big area and you can go anywhere in there. Um, so I think we're going to see robots, you know, just running into each other as they're passing through there, but we're going to see... 
uh, tall blockers right in front of the, the shooting areas. Um, I, I think that's certainly a possibility, particularly against the, the really short robots. And uh, I think we'll see if teams try to spend too much time taking free shots from unprotected areas. I, I think they're going to get hit by defender, even not full-time defenders. It's just like if you're you know loading up your robot and you see your robot taking a shot in a, an unprotected area, you, you should just go by and slam into them as you're driving by, and that costs you two seconds and costs them five or six seconds to reposition themselves. You know. So, Christine, are we going to see blockers back again? What's your opinion on that? Oh, I'm sure you will. Um, I think in addition to what Caleb said, because the 2013 comparison is, is really what I thought about before the whole 2016 parallels. But in 2016, if you go and watch New England District Championships or any later um, events from that year in New England, it's like if you need lessons on how to play uh, defense against shooters, there's plenty of match footage to watch of people just <laughs> slamming into our team especially. Um some great footage of us being knocked onto our backs as well but i do think there is going to be like just a ton of defense in terms of you know blocking people from getting to a place where they know they're going to be able to shoot or you know i'm curious to see how building a blocker or having a blocker um will go because i know in 2016 there were so many rules about it later in the season of like it needs to be transparent you know but then it didn't need to be so i don't know curious to see how that goes all right we're going to kind of hit a lightning round here a little bit and don't forget uh to uh type refire in for your chance to win uh this anderson connector as well too we'll be shipping that out uh so we'll be wrapping that up in just a couple minutes so uh quick fire here uh i want to ask dave here from enraged cracker should a rookie team use a drive base kit or design their own drivetrain i uh, use the kit the kit's awesome I think that you can do so much with it, all the different motor options, the gear options. Um, I think if you're a rookie team, you should really just focus on getting a really good drive base, more so than doing a lot of other things. I think that's first and foremost. Um, the the Kipot is an amazing thing that a lot of teams can utilize and put it together. And I know uh, 125 and Christine can talk more about this, but they have uh, great resources on how to best utilize that stuff. Mm. Uh, Christine, question from uh, Firehouse Game. Do you see Swerve Drive uh, phasing out potentially this year? Are they are Swerve Drives going to be able to make it through that middle area without having complications? I don't think it's going to get phased out. I think the teams that have really developed a robust system that works for them, they're going to continue to use it. If you look at, like, Strike Force in 2017 or, um, like, Bomb Squad, like, those teams just plow through just about anything with their swerve drive. So I think for teams that have really like developed something legit, it will be fine for them. And I think they'll be able to maneuver the field really, really well. But I think for teams that are newer for it, I just don't see it working out as well. All right, and last question we're going to ask for this. Don't forget, if you are watching live, we are going to have our RA3D recap coming up in just a few minutes. We'll be talking with uh, First Capital, showing their progress, shooters, intakes, drivetrains, all that stuff is coming together, so can't wait to bring that up in just a few minutes uh, for you. Uh, Caleb, I want to ask you a uh, last final question here uh, in regards to, we talked about buddy climbing earlier, and uh, Jimbo Fien, I know a fielders in chat, talked about that you only get a 12-inch area outside the bumper zone uh, this year, so versus in 2017 when it was, uh, or 2018, I'm sorry, when it was a bit uh, larger. So how do, how do you package something like that to, to really accomplish it, or do you just abandon it? I mean... I've never been on an elite enough <laughs> team that would that would be one of our design requirements. I mean, twenty maybe maybe twenty fifty two like my senior year, but um, it's it's not something I would like to package. It, yeah. it sounds it sounds like a tough it's a tall order to do certainly, but I, I still think you're going to see the the very elite teams doing it because that's the only way to to guarantee you get that ranking point. And everyone knows that's that's the way to to seed high in quals and that's the way to build the alliance you want to to make it out to einstein so it's we're certainly going to see it it's it is going to be a rough challenge for sure yeah absolutely all right we're going to draw for that giveaway that we had here once again refire was the uh keyword to type in if you'd like to win the uh refire uh quick connect with the anderson power pull up on screen here so let's go ahead and draw uh for that and the winner of this is going to be 
Uh, Bob Zinkoff. Bob Zinkoff is the winner. Uh, a subscriber, so you know what that means, chat. Lots of rigged emotes uh, coming in. Uh, I want to see many, many, many emotes. And don't forget, if you haven't noticed, if you're, uh, if you have, are either your, it's your first time on Fun or you haven't been here for a while, uh, Fun now has Fun Bucks or Channel Points, as Twitch calls it, uh, that you can redeem to unlock emotes as well to modify emotes, do a lot of cool stuff, uh, and make announcements, that sort of Ooh. thing. Uh, so congratulations, Bob Zinkoff. Make sure you reach out to us uh, on First Updates now, either on Twitch or in our Discord, and that is your opportunity uh, to get us to ship that out to you. Um, and I have a feeling that uh, Bob, uh, I think Bob knows how to send his address. So first name, last name, mailing address, all that stuff is what we need. I know it sounds crazy, but we have to say it every single time uh, as we come through here. All right, uh, last thing uh, before we wrap up, don't forget the RA3D uh, recap stream coming up in just a few minutes. Uh, Quick round table. Caleb, we'll start with you, then go Christine and Dave. Yay, nay on Infinite Recharge. Uh, and how excited are you, or what are you most excited about for this year? Uh, I'm, I'm definitely a yay on Infinite Recharge. I, I think it combines a lot of fun aspects of previous games that we've seen. I'm excited to see how long of shots teams are going to make. I, I'm looking to see who can consistently make shots from, from very far back. Christine? I'm a yay on Infinite Recharge. Um I'm excited to see how teams get better and better. I think there's a lot of room for that. And I'm going to give a big shout out and way to go to everybody at headquarters that worked on this game. I know that they have put in so much time just in talking to JB Luce, the FRC team advocate, the amount of time in the last year and especially in the last two months getting ready for kickoff. It's definitely paid off. I feel like they did a really great job with the like just show today and everything else so i'm excited to see it live and in person this season dave how are you feeling about infinite recharge uh definitely two thumbs up i'm super excited for this game i think it'll be fun to watch from a uh from both uh on the drive team side of the glass and as a spectator um just gotta give a quick shout out you guys should go check out our build blog that we're gonna post we're it's team 6328 is completely transparent with our uh, our builds this year. So if you guys have any questions, you should uh, check it out. Uh, and I'll give a final plug, too, uh, for a couple of great resources. Go check out the Compass Alliance if you're looking for some awesome uh, resources, both for new and veteran teams as well, too. Um, and then I know there is, uh, I think, the Open Alliance, uh, which has a few teams showing their uh, build blogs. Dave, is that what you guys are part of as well? Yeah, yeah. So we're super excited to be doing that this year. Uh, like I said, 100% transparent in all of our decisions. Um, so if you guys need any any help to think through some decisions or just kind of want to see what somebody else is doing, you guys should definitely check it out and connect with us. Yeah, and we are actually going to have uh, some members of the Open Alliance on in just a couple of weeks to talk about their progress during build season, uh, unveil some of that background stuff. So you can go see it transparently there, but you'll have a great opportunity to ask questions as well, too. Uh, so infinite recharge i'm going to give a thumbs up as well too uh i'm excited for it i think there's a lot of cool aspects to it uh it's reminiscent of bringing back some old games but in the right way of which i think first has missed on before and i'm very glad they've done it uh and i just want to mention uh and i know dave you're you're talking about this how the production value at kickoff uh was a nice thing while you were there uh i was excited to see some more live stuff back uh though i mean obviously some rambles going on but that happens as well too uh and um uh, maybe work on that uh, that whole scripted like in the control center thing. But other than that, uh, I I'm, I think first did a great job preparing this year. I'm excited to see what's to come for Infinite Recharge, and I can't wait to have more of it. Uh, so Christine, Dave, and Caleb, uh, time is up for us, so we got to get ready for the uh, first capital recap. But thank you so much uh, for taking the time, teams. Good luck to you uh, during this competition season. Uh, can't wait to have more stuff. Make sure you're tuning in the first updates now. Uh, follow us on Discord. Check out our Facebook and Instagram twitter we also have uh, fun ftc as well too lots of great stuff coming on so can't wait to talk more about it with that said our 3d first capital recap coming up in just a few minutes we'll see you next time on fun talk to you then see ya thanks for watching if you want more fun content be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos you can also directly help support fun by visiting our patreon at patreon.com forward slash first updates now or by subscribing at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now Thanks to all of our co-executive producers on Patreon and Tier 2 Plus subscribers on Twitch, keeping fun loud, live, and independent.